Hello. All right, well, just want to say thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm Nick Racklin. Uh, really appreciate you guys taking some time out of your day and coming and check, checking this out. Um, obviously, we think this is really, really important stuff because you know, we really support um, everything that we're doing here with Ryan 11. Uh, specifically, we think this is really important not just because we're trying to give uh, scholarships to kids to go to high-level private educations, but obviously much more than that. It's going to give them a chance to get into college, and not just any college, but good college, especially when you get to see a place like this, like prep, how fantastic it is, and you know all the great facilities and teachers and everything. Um, but outside of that, it's not really just about the education. It's about building the entire person at Brian 11. We're not just concerned <clears throat> excuse me, about your academic success. We're also concerned about your athletic success, your social success, your, your mental health, your physical health, all this other stuff as well. Um, so that's, that's really, really what, what we really want to do. Um, that's kind of our mission. Um, so kind of without further ado, I just want to introduce Keandre. He is from around the area, went to good council for high school, um, was fortunate enough to get an opportunity to play at Ohio State after that. Uh, spent three years there, and then after that was over, uh, took a year at University of Maryland uh, with Coach Loxie, who uh, we'll talk a little bit about later today. <laughs> um, and then after that, obviously fortunate enough to play with the Cincinnati Bengals. So uh, without further ado, Keandre Jones. Hello, can you hear me? One second, a little technical difficulty. Okay, there we go. Can you hear me? Yeah. All right, perfect. Um, Keandre Jones, originally from Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I value time. Time is very important to me. And uh, I just want to say thank you for everybody that's in attendance today. Uh, I'm not just doing this for myself. I'm not just doing this for the family. But most importantly, I'm doing it for the people that got me to this, to this point. And, uh, you know, for a great cause. My brother, my teammate, my friend, uh, just like myself, uh, Brian was that to me. Um, I'm a son. I'm a brother. I'm a teammate. I'm someone who's dedicated their whole life because of this game that brought me, the people that's in this room today, into my life. There was a lot of sacrifices that, that were made. And because of those sacrifices, I'm able to sit here, stand here today, and let you guys know my journey. So bear with me. Like I said, I value you guys', you guys time. And uh, I'm going to go into the beginning. Uh, obviously, when you start off in life, it's always going to be bumps in the roads. You're going to experience trials and tribulations. But for me, those trials came a little earlier. In my early teens, you guys, you just don't know. Life has always passed you by. Like I said, time is very important to me, and I value that, and I understood that. The most important thing to me growing up was seeing my mother, who's front row right now, Lauren Middleton. Stand up for me, Mom. <laughs> Yes, I appreciate the applause because she is, uh, she's my why. She's why I started playing football. She's why I'm here today. And for that, I'm forever grateful. So I want to say thank you. I couldn't leave you out. So there's your, there's your five minutes, <laughs> two seconds of fame. <laughs> no, but honestly, um, without my mother, I wouldn't be here today. And uh, for you guys, I want you to guys to understand, you know, Whoever it is, your parents, your friends, your teammates, loved ones, you have the opportunity to reach out to somebody. And for me, that opportunity was my coaches. I see my high school coach, Coach Bob Malloy, Hall of Famer, good counsel. I know we're at Georgetown Prep right now, but <laughs> he's a Hall of Famer for sure. In my mind, that's one of my role models and mentors. Um, like I was saying, you need those people in your life, whether it's your brother, your teammate, your friend, a loved one. Each person played a critical role in my life. Without them, like I said, I would not be here. And I'm forever in debt to them. One thing that I noticed growing up, my mother, she sacrificed so much. She's a single parent. I, didn't, I wasn't raised from, with, with a dad. But that doesn't mean the work stops. She picked up the load, she carried both roles, and she showed me the way. I needed that blueprint. So by the time I was 10, 
it was easy for me to see that she had already made those sacrifices. And the reason why I say at 10 years old, I had to make the most crucial decision of my life. What do I do with this game of football that was brought to me? And I took advantage of it. How many of you guys seen the blind side? Perfect, perfect. So I don't have to explain too much. But Michael Orr, he was drafted in the first round in the NFL back in 2009. Michael Orr, he was homeless. Michael Orr, was, he was homeless. His, uh, his family, not so much. It wasn't no family dynamic. He had to turn to people that helped him, his adopted, adopted parents, bring him in. Without that role, he would not be in the NFL. Like I said, Michael Orr was homeless. No parents, no support system, no family structure. And I knew for me, that's what I craved, that's what I needed. And I, I, I was fortunate enough to have one parent, one parent to show me the way. But like, like anything in life, it takes a village. And it wasn't, just, it wasn't just my mom helping out. It was the people that's in this room today. I see familiar, familiar faces, friends, coaches, mentors, brothers that helped me get to here. And I want to let you guys know, those are gonna be the most crucial times in your life to reach out to somebody. Those are the people that's gonna help you get to that next level. And it doesn't have to be sports. It can be anything you dream of, but you have to want it. And for me, I wanted it at 10 years old. Now, what, did I, what was I gonna do with this talent? Obviously, I'm in the NFL, right? But how did I get here? What sacrifices did I make to get to this point? Because in life, you are gonna have to make sacrifices. Everything is not gonna be handed to you. And I understood that. Like I said, my mother, she was a single parent. She showed me the way. So when I was 10 years old, I made a decision, my own decision, whether she agreed with it or not. I know she's probably like, well, what's going on? But I made a decision. I said, okay, single parent, three kids. I had my little sister right here in front. I got my older brother. He's three years older than me. My little sister is three years younger than me. What am I going to do to take this stress and this weight of the world, that pressure off my mom? So I made, I made a decision. At 10 or 11 years old, I made a decision. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go hard with the game of football. Because why would I waste this opportunity? Why would I waste this moment knowing that my mother made sacrifices for me to be in this position? Why waste your time playing the game that we love? It's a game, right? We love to play this game. We make sacrifices daily. Your parents are bringing you back and forth to practice. I, was, I didn't have the opportunity for my mom. We had no car. We, had no, we, had, we didn't have the opportunity to do that. So you know who stepped up and picked up that load? My mentors, my friends' parents, my coaches. My mom was always there in the picture. But in order for me to succeed, it took a whole village for me to get to this point. So at 10 or 11 years old, I bounced around from home to home just so my mom wouldn't have to worry about football, about another stress in her life, about feeling that pressure, that pressure of life that we all feel at moments, at times. I made a decision at 10, 11, 12, 10 or 11, 12 years old that I was gonna take that, that pressure off my mom. And it was a crucial decision because without that decision, I wouldn't be here today. I told her, I was like, Ma, I'm staying over at a friend's house. I used to call her like, Ma, can I just stay over at a friend's house? Knowing I didn't want to come home, because I'm like, I'm having fun. I'm young, I'm young. I really want, honestly, I wanted to have fun. I'm like, you know what, they got food, they got all this, they got hot water, they got this. They don't even realize. They don't realize, they don't realize what I'm going back to. Mind you, like I said, to me, it was normal. This was my normal, not having hot water, not having food in there, or my mom taking the sacrifice to make sure like, hey, you guys are good. She made sure we ate first. I'm like, okay, maybe, maybe, maybe if she doesn't have to worry about one kid, maybe I can just stay, you know, over here, you know? So she could take, so I could take that pressure off her. That pressure of life, that's overwhelming. You talk about one parent, three kids? I'm single, 25 years old, and I don't have no kids. And I'm telling you, like, it's a, it's a battle. <laughs> it's a battle. It's a battle, honestly. Taking care of one person, which is myself, is a battle in itself. So to see my mother take on three responsibilities, you're talking about life. What I tell you in the beginning, time. That time is important. So I made the sacrifice that I was going to have to take some time with her, from her, and play this game. 
So time passes. We get into high school. I go to Good Counsel High School. Now, the special thing about Good Counsel High School, I knew there were guys like Stefan Diggs. How many of you guys know Stefan Diggs? Perfect, perfect, perfect. Stefan is like the face of the NFL right now. Mind you, I told you the most important thing. I had friends, I had mentors, I had a blueprint, and then I had role models. I'm not gonna lie, I thought I was gonna be like Stefan Diggs. I thought I was gonna be a receiver. I thought I was gonna be, I really did, I honestly did, until coach put me out there and I couldn't catch a pass. <laughs> I'm telling you, I couldn't, I couldn't catch one ball. I couldn't catch one ball, but I knew Stefan was leading, leading the way. Stefan was from my area, Montgomery County. I needed to see that. Visual represent, representation is so important. You guys need, it, need to see me. You need to, I need to show you guys that you can be here too. I need to, you need to see that, visually. I need to spread words of affirmation to you guys. You can make it, you can make it, you can make it, you can make it. But it's not about sports. I seen the example and I just followed the blueprint that Coach Bob Malloy has displayed for years. So I get to high school and I'm going through the motions just like any high school kid. I'm like, okay, in order for me to obtain the goal to get a scholarship, because now, now we get, we get closer and closer to, okay, Keandre, what have you been doing throughout the years? You staying with family and friends. What have you been doing? I stayed with seven different families by the time I graduated high school. And that was to take the stress off my mother. But I was prideful in that because each family played a critical part in my success, you know? Without them, I wouldn't have made it through high school. I wouldn't have made it through college. I wouldn't have made it through middle school. 10, 11, 12 years old, I told myself, I'm gonna make sure that I make all seven families proud. And how was that? It was by my success. I don't define my success on money. The money comes and goes. I'm gonna tell you that right now. You're gonna need more and more. <laughs> but that's if you're investing in the right way. You, you should be cool. So learn from me. <laughs> but um, money comes and goes. And I knew for a fact I had to make sure I made these seven families proud. I had to make sure I was doing everything that I needed to to sustain the life that I was chasing, which was not the, the cars, the big house, the, the whatever. It was the satisfaction of knowing that I worked my butt off to get to college for free. You're talking about a free scholarship. People are dealing with student debts, you know? I don't have any debts. I don't have to pay back anything. I was able to obtain a scholarship to the Ohio, the Ohio State University. The Ohio State University. I couldn't even imagine that at that time too. I had the same look, I'm like, what? The Ohio State University, what is Ohio State? I had no clue. I had no clue what a university that big and the magnitude and the name of itself, how important that was. My friends were all excited. We got JC8 in the, in the crowd right here. We got Luke, where Luke at? We got Luke right here. We got, uh, where's Sean at? My best friend, my dog Sean. He, like, everybody was so excited and they, and they always told me like, keep you going, you going there, you going places. When people see you doing good things, they want to help. They want to help, they want to be there for you. So like any opportunity, anything I did, I took advantage of that opportunity and I committed to Ohio State. I will put it on a side note, I was, I flipped, I flipped, I was uh, with Maryland first. <laughs> I, was, I wanted to stay, you guys, I wanted to stay home, I wanted to represent Maryland, but we all know, Coach Locks, I'm glad you're not here, because <laughs> at the time, they were struggling. Maryland was struggling. But for me, I love, I, I thrive, I thrive off of a challenge. I love to challenge myself. Like I said, I made sacrifices early. I live with seven different families. Just to pursue this dream. I wanted to take, to take the stress off my mom. I said I can easily go to college. I've been living out of the house since I was 10 or 11. <laughs> Are you talking about, I can, I can easily do college. That's easy. But no, it's still that pressure. I felt that pressure. I felt that pressure of the, of the world, of the seven families, of my mother. I put that on myself though. Because at the end of the day, it was me versus me. I always knew it was me versus me. So I get to college. Man, college was a great time. You guys are gonna experience it soon, real soon. I want y'all to take time and realize. 
Okay, a little bit. That's all right. That's all right. <laughs> I, want to, I want you guys to take time and realize how critical this time period is. When I was at college, it was my toughest time adjusting to not having my village around me. It was my toughest time not having my village around me. That was the first time in my life where I had the experience. I didn't have my village. It was no mom to call, hey mom, can I get a home cooked meal? Now, mind you, we had people that were generous, like Ms. Condon's in the crowd right now. She used to send me a nice little care package. I used to love those. I'm like, wow, man. So I had my, I had my village, but it was from far away. It was distant. So what do I have to rely on? I had to rely on my teammates. I had to go network and build a new village, a new surrounding, because new territory can be uncomfortable. But like I said, I thrive in uncomfortable situations. 10, 11, 12 years old, I've been out the house. I know how to survive. And that's all my mother, all I ever seen my mother do. Raising three kids, you're in survival mode. So by the time I was out the house at 10, 11, 12, I was in survival mode. So college was a breeze for me, I'm not gonna lie. Every situation I encountered, I wasn't playing when I got to Ohio State. And we all know how that goes. Everybody wants to be the superstar. Everybody wants to be the best. And I strive to be the best. I work my butt off day in, day in, day and night. I wanted to be the star. I wanted to be the face of the program. Like I said, I thought I was Stephon Diggs. I thought I was gonna score touchdowns. But I play linebacker, I play defense, so we do the dirty work. Mind you, I was at three, Ohio State for three years. I spent three years not playing at Ohio State. People wrote me off. I see the comments. I see the Twitter. I see the Instagram. I'm not a big social media person, but look, I'm human. I see it all. And I feel the doubters. You can feel when somebody doesn't, you know, want you to succeed. You can see in people's eyes, because I'm big on eye contact. I'm big on looking somebody in their face and making sure, like, I want to see your eyes. I want you to tell me the truth. And I asked questions while I was at Ohio State. I asked my coaches. I asked my teammates. They're like, hey, Dre, you should be playing. I'm like, hey, man, I'm just going to keep working. I'm just going to keep working. That's all I ever did. That's all I ever knew was just work. That's all I ever knew was just work. And by the time I ended up leaving Ohio State, I transferred my junior year because Coach Meyer, Urban Meyer, he left. And that was the guy that recruited me. And we all know if you play football, once your position coach goes and your head coach goes, you better go too. That's my advice. That's my advice. So you better write, you might want to write that down. You might want to write that down. <laughs> but honestly, I left too. And I was presented with the opportunity to come back home, uh, familiar territory. This is where I started playing football. I was grateful for the opportunity. Coach Loxley, he took a chance with me. I could have went anywhere in the world to finish my last year of football. And mind you, this is the last year where there's no guarantees. There's no, I'm going to the NFL after this. I transferred, I transferred from Ohio State to come back to the University of Maryland, which I love, that's my home. But like I said, Let's be real, what's, what's the chances? What's the chances of me transferring from Ohio State and making it at Maryland? So I get to Maryland, and I'm a linebacker. I play, I stand up to play. Maryland puts me on the line as a defensive end. For you guys that don't know what a defensive end is, you're rushing a quarterback. Look at me, I'm not that big. <laughs> I'm not that big. You might think so, but I'm rushing the quarterback. I'm not even playing my position. But to me, that didn't matter. Put me in uncomfortable situations. Put me in uncomfortable situations. I thrive in those uncomfortable situations. And yes, just like any student athlete, mentally, I went through things. I battled with anxiety, because I knew the pressures of, that I was dealing with. I went through things mentally, I was, I was like, yo, what am I gonna do? I'm playing a new school, new position, and I gotta make it to the league? I gotta make it to the NFL. I gotta buy moms that house. I gotta buy mom that car. I gotta retire moms. I had a why though. I had a why. I understood. Those seven families that helped me out, I can't stop now. No, I couldn't stop now. And I wasn't going to. 
Like I said, I thrive off the being in uncomfortable situations. I had my best season yet as a starter, my first time starting. One year, it took me one year to start in college. And then, after I finished, we prepared for the NFL draft. How many of you guys familiar with the NFL draft? That's, our, that's my job interview. That, everything that I did leading up to the NFL draft was for this one day. This one day called a pro day, a combine. Now for me, I didn't get no combine, I didn't get any pro day, and I didn't get a senior bowl invite. And a senior bowl invite is basically another job interview where you get to display one last time in front of all the coaches why you deserve to be in the NFL. And I didn't get it. But then again, like I said, I done been th I've been through so much already. I had sacrificed so much already. I did not let that get me down. And by God's grace, I was draft undrafted free agent for the Chicago Bears. And like anything in life, all you need is one opportunity. One team out of the 32 teams, Chicago Bears picked me up as an undrafted free agent. My signing bonus was like 10,000. After, after taxes, 4,000, 5,000. I can't even remember. It was three years ago. <laughs> but, um, man, I was just grateful for the opportunity. And then finally, boom, I'm in the league. I'm in the league. So I'm going to relax, right? No, I went even harder. Now, they always tell you this. It's hard getting into the league. It's even harder staying in the league. I'm going on my fourth season in the NFL currently. And while I was preparing, all I could think about was, wow, like I'm here. I had to come to light moment. Like, I accomplished my goal. I was satisfied. I was like, I really made it. I really made it. I'm in Chicago. Hey, Ma, come on. Ma, come on. <laughs> my mom was there with me. All right, what happens? The last day of training camp, I end up getting released. So you could say my football dreams was crushed. Last day of training camp, I ended up getting released. And I remember the only team I worked out for was the Cincinnati Bengals. The only team I worked out for was the Cincinnati Bengals. They called me two days later. Three years go by. I done played in the Super Bowl. I done accomplished my goal of staying in the league three years. The average is two and a half. But during that process, guys, Mentally, how I stayed composed, I latched on to people. I latched on to my friends, my family, my sisters, my brothers. And while I was at Ohio State, I ended up joining a mental health group. It was called Redefine Athletic Standards. That group played a critical role in my success. Without surrounding myself with guys in that group, I'm telling you, I would have struggled. But in, Rede in the group, we had small circles, and we talked about our problems, just like I'm doing now. I'm just talking. I'm, been, I'm, I'm just giving you the real. I'm giving you the real. I'm being vulnerable in front of you. You have to be vulnerable. You have to let yourself become open. As men, we are taught to be tough, masculine. Don't show your emotions. Well, I'm here to tell you that's wrong. That's going to kill you at the end quicker than anything. This game is 80% physical. No, let's reverse it, 20% physical, 80% mental. You know why? Because guys lose this early. Guys can't understand the playbook. How would I be able to understand a playbook if I'm not good up top? How can I talk to my, my friends and family if I'm not good up top? I caught on to people. Like I said, my mother was one of those people. My friends, Sean attended, he was at Ohio. He was in Ohio when I was at Ohio State at Denison. So I had people, I still had my village surrounded by me. While being in the league, man, I'm telling you, it's gonna be, it's gonna be times where you question a lot of things, but one thing you cannot do is question yourself, because that doubt will send you down a wrong path. And like I said, you gotta latch on to somebody. You gotta speak up. You gotta ask for help. And like I said, I wouldn't be here if I didn't ask for help, if I didn't join that small group outside of football, outside the locker room. I was a people's person. I wanted to be surrounded by people who was on the same path as myself. 
And being in the league, going into my fourth year, was a journey that I would have never imagined. But if I stopped, I wouldn't be in front of you guys to tell you the story. Last year, when I went to the Super Bowl, my mom had got engaged and proposed to. Like, one of my craziest and most memorable moments that she got engaged at the Super Bowl. But what to come after that was anything that I was not prepared for. Because in life, you're gonna take losses. You're gonna take failures. But it's okay, it's on how you respond. Before the Super Bowl, I lost one of my close friends, Brian. And that was my brother, honestly. We did everything, I'm telling you. He came to that playoff game during the Raiders, and that was my last physical time seeing him. And the last thing he said to me, he hugged me, said, I love you. And those three words are so powerful to me because I don't take those for, for granted. I love you took me a long way. I remember the first time my mom said it. And for him to say it, that was important to me. Because when my mom told me, my mom didn't say I love you, we didn't, we didn't communicate that verbally. She showed it physically. So when she said it to me, when I was at Ohio State, before she dropped me off and I was on my own, that, made me, that triggered something in me to where I was like, you know what, I'm loved, I'm cared for, I'm gonna be okay. Just call your mom if you need something. <laughs> I wasn't afraid to call my mom if I needed something, which was really just an ear. She'll say, she'll deny I didn't call her, but I called her. <laughs> she'll deny. But losing Brian was the first step into like losses. And I felt like I failed. I felt like I failed as a friend, and I felt like I failed as a teammate. Because you're gonna experience losses. You're gonna experience failure. I felt like I failed and let my, my, my brother down. And then, a couple months later, my roommate, a guy that's from this area, Dwayne Haskins, he gets killed. I was roommates with him at Ohio State. He gets killed, 24 years old. Brian was 26. I, I took two losses back to back in two months. And I felt like I failed again because I did not reach out enough. I wasn't a good friend. And I talked to somebody about it. I said, yo, like, what could, I, what could I have I done to stop this from happening? But in actuality, all I could do was be there for him. That's all, that's all you can do. Just be there for him. Be an ear. Help somebody out. Unfortunately, they're not here with us anymore. And then the last third loss and failure that I felt like was when my mom got engaged, we lost one of our new family members. Her fiance's daughter, she ended up getting shot and killed in DC. And this all happened in three months after the Super Bowl. Well, before the Super Bowl, Brian passed, Dwayne passed after the Super Bowl, and then my mom's fiance daughter got shot and killed in three months. And I'm back, I'm back saying to myself and questioning myself, what could I have done? But I understood, this was an uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation. I was in an uncomfortable, uncomfortable situation, uncomfortable territory. I had to be there for my family. I had to be there for my friends. And the one way where, where that helped me out, they were there for me. Don't push people away, especially if they're good. Don't push people away, especially if they're good to you. I understood that. I had to let people in and become vulnerable. This is my first time telling anybody this in front of first time opening up and becoming vulnerable. I say this to tell you this. It's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to open up. It's okay. I'm here with you. You do not have to do it alone. I promise you. I'm doing it myself. This is my therapy. This is my therapy. I'm an open book. You can ask anybody. I'm an open book. I wear it. I wear it proud because I know who I am. You have to know your why. You have to know your why. I wear it proud because I know who I am. I know who Keandre Jones am, is, and I know where I'm going. I can't tell you about tomorrow, but I can tell you about now. You gotta live in the moment. Time is not on our side. Every day we are losing things. 
Like I just told you, I told you about three losses that I would never ever get back. I spent amount of time with all three of them, but I cherish it, I value it, I respect it because I understood that time was so precious. I'm gonna leave you with this. I always told myself, I said I'm here for a good time, not a long time. And after those three losses, I was like, dang, kid, you gotta change that. Because don't get me wrong, all three of them were living, but they didn't know how much time they had left. They didn't know how much time they had left. I used to say, I'm here for a good time, not a long time. Now, I just, I wanna give as much of me to this world, as much love and care and respect in the way I move as a human and be there for people. Now, my new quote is, I just wanna die empty. That's what that means, I just wanna die empty. And if that means pouring into you guys, my mentees, <laughs> my family, my friends, I just want to die empty. And I hope that you can feel the same in return. So thank you. I know that was long. I know that was long. Well, thank you, Keontra. That was amazing. Honestly, we did fantastic. Thank you for that. Uh, something I kind of want to touch on that Keandre said is when you're doing good things, people want to help. People really want to be on your side. They want to make things happen for you and with you. Um, and to that extent, um, we're really happy to kind of be here tonight with you guys. Obviously, we see a lot of people that seem to want to help and seem very, very happy to be here, which is fantastic. Um, and on top of that, we've created partnerships with a lot of these great schools that they also want to help us because they see that we, we want to make a difference, we want to do great things. So schools like Good Counsel, like St. John's, like Bullis, like Archbishop Spaulding, Holy Child, and Georgetown Visitation, we've all partnered with them um, for the upcoming school year and further beyond that as well, um, kind of help some kids in, that, in those schools as well, kind of create opportunity for them and, and the kids that we're working with as well. So we're really excited about that. Uh, we've raised $300,000 to go towards scholarships and other projects. And uh, also on top of that, or with that I should say, we've, ra we've committed $75,000 in scholarships uh, going forward, which we're really, really proud of. Um, and hopefully that's not the end as well. Obviously we want to continue to help people and we want to continue to raise people up. And like I said, not just in academic success. Uh, in athletic success, in mental health, in physical health, in spiritual health. We're not, really, we're not really here just to help you along the line. We want to really help develop and, and create an opportunity for you to see the whole self and be met where you are and really, really improve in every aspect. Um, so, unfortunately today, uh, Coach Loxie was supposed to be here to speak, but because of a certain athletic association at the college level, uh, he's not allowed to be here tonight. Um, sorry? The audio Oh, okay, perfect. Um, but yeah, so he's actually sent us a video um, to, to say something about, about the program and all that. So uh, if you guys could just take a look, that'd be great. I'm Coach Mike Loxley, head football coach here at the University of Maryland. I want to first thank John and, and Roseanne Strip Matter for allowing me an opportunity to come share with you. I wish I could be in person, but due to NCAA rules, I can't. Um, again, I want to thank those guys and all the people involved with the Brian 11 Foundation um, for all the hard work that they do in our community. Uh, as a parent who also lost a child, I continue to send the strength and the prayers to the Strip Matter family, his friends, and all of his loved ones as they continue to celebrate his life. Uh, what I want to talk to you a little bit now is about mental health and just how important it is uh, for us as adults uh, to, to identify and be able to send our, the young people that are sent underneath us uh, to, the, to get the help they possibly need. And here at the University of Maryland, we take mental health very seriously. Uh, we oftentimes say it's okay to not be okay. And we've done everything in the last three years that I've been here uh, to continue to upgrade our mental health providers, our mental health people here that work with our team. And as I found as a leader of 120, 18 to 22 year olds, this is such a pivotal time in their life where I see a lot of guys that come in and are dealing with issues 
and it's my job as the leader to help them unpack the luggage that they bring with them and, and it can't be done alone. And I want to encourage anyone that's here today to continue to understand that it is okay to not be okay. Uh, when you break an arm or break a leg, people can see the pain and the hurt that you're going through. Uh, when your brain is not working properly, it's something that people can't see. And I think there needs to be a compassion for it. Uh, I know the work that the Brian 11 Foundation does will continue to help strengthen our community as we continue to support the young people that come through this program by providing them with the necessary encouragement, help, and resources to get the help necessary. Again, I, I, I can't tell you how important an issue this is. I can't tell you that as adults that are hearing this, uh, to be aware and continue to be diligent in talking to your children about the importance of mental health and that if they need the help, that it's okay to get help. And I sure wish uh, you guys the best. I hope that this, uh, hope tonight has been a great night for everyone. And I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys in the near future. As always, go Terps. <laughs> now if I get this to work. You guys can hear me, right? Okay. Um, obviously, thank you guys for coming today. We really appreciate it. Um, obviously, you guys have seen some, some pretty awesome stuff out of Keandre today, but obviously, um, there's still some more things that, that can be said. So. If any of you guys have any questions today or anything you guys wanted to ask, feel free. Just raise a hand and uh, we can we can in, get you going. Yes. Hey, Andre, you talked briefly about uh, working with a small group to help you feel better mentally. Or, I'm assuming that's what. Like. Can you talk about what brought that up and what you got out of that? Yes. So, the question was, um, what did I get out of working with a small group? And what I got out of it was I seen familiar faces that were going through the same situation, situations that I was going through and experiencing. Like I talked about anxiety. I had always had high anxiety because I felt the pressures of life. You know, it's just a lot of people be, has been, have been saying, you know, life be lifing, which is true. And what does that look like? Hardships, heartbreak, struggle. Mentally, physically, whatever that looks like. So we set up small groups. Well, I, I, took the, I took it in my hands to join something outside of my sport, to join a small group that, of guys that played football, guys that played basketball, and we e even had the woman to hear a woman's side of how they dealt with mental health. So just to see both sides helped me a lot uh, internalize what I was going through. Because I, in a way, I used to be real insensitive to the subject of mental health because I didn't understand it. It was never talked about in my household. Like I told you, it was survival. You didn't have time to, to think. <laughs> We're trying to survive, <laughs> you know? So hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, I, I was hungry for the knowledge of why I was feeling a certain way. I was hungry to understand what made me feel this, and I wanted to relate. I wanted to see if other people were experiencing the same things I felt when I was uh, coming up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a follow-up question, actually, to the uh, gentleman's question right here. What helped you maintain a positive outlook from going through that group experience? What, what was one of the biggest learnings you had from that group? The biggest thing I got from it was I wasn't alone. I wasn't alone, and I had people going through the same situations. It might not be, oh, you're, you're typical, like, hey, like, you know, I'm struggling, I have one parent at home, but I can relate to one thing. If it was just one thing, I knew I can relate. And the fact that they were there in that small group, I knew they wanted to speak. Because out of 50,000 students, we only had, what, probably like 30 kids there. So those are the 30 kids that actually wanted that help. I never felt pressured or forced to join the group. I felt like it was a sanctuary, it was a safe space to come talk, just like how we're doing here today, you know? Mm -hmm. Don't be shy, y'all. I usually get, how much do you make? <laughs> I know y'all wanna know that. Uh, so, you talk a lot about the mental state.
side of sports, and obviously you and the Bengals went to the Super Bowl uh, last year. So by, you know, with all the playoff games, like there has to be a lot of excitement, but mentally, as well as physically, like you guys, like how worn down were y'all? Like, that's gotta take a big mental effect playing all those games. Yeah, so the question was, how worn down was the team making it all the way to the Super Bowl? And honestly, we were so fatigued and tired and drained, just like any other team. But just like anything with life, when you know you're right there and you're about to accomplish something, you keep going. You're not going to stop, right? When you know you're about to win a race, you know? You're not going to stop. We were just, we were at the finish line. We were at the finish line. So, and we knew our why. We knew our why. Super Bowl champions. You couldn't tell nobody different. You couldn't tell my family friends I was going to be on stage as a Super Bowl champion. You couldn't tell anybody different. So we knew our why. We knew all we had was one game at a time. One game, one day, one minute, one hour, 60 minutes. That's all it takes. 60 minutes. A play lasted six, four to six seconds. You telling me we can't last 60 minutes? So we knew we had to make that sacrifice and understand, look, we worked our butts off to get to this point. We got to finish. So we were tired just like anybody else. Just like I know you're human. I know you're tired. That was a long speech. I know how it is. I know how it is. I was you. But I took something away. I want you guys to take something away, even if it's just one thing. Trust me, guys, I know it. But yeah, we were, we were definitely tired. <laughs> Andre, can you explain to everyone, like you used the word neutral to me, about when you wake up in the morning? You say, say it again? Neutral. You know, you know how you always like to be in neutral? Can you explain that to everyone? I think it's important. You just talk about my routine, right? No, so about your, yeah, just where you, when you wake up, where you Oh, yeah, where, where I'm, fe how I'm feeling. Yep. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Um, I think that's so important to... You have to make a choice every day you wake up. Life is all about choices. And I can tell you this, you're gonna go through a million feeling, feelings. You're gonna experience so many emotions because that's what life is gonna do to you. But every day I lay down, I gotta make sure I reset. And when I wake up in the morning, I know I got a choice to make it a good day. And maybe, maybe my good day looks like 20%. You know how our coach is always saying 100% effort, 100% effort. I'm not gonna lie, I be tired too. <laughs> but I'm not one of those guys when we work out, and my teammates and my friends get attested to this, I'm not one of those guys that put my hands on my knees or show that, you know, show that I'm tired. I wake up, I had a choice. I wanna show like, no, I got this. So I don't, I don't put my hands on my knees. So when I wake up every morning, I make the choice to say, hey, look, it's gonna be a good day. Even if it's not, sometimes you gotta psych yourself into having a good day because every day is not gonna be perfect. And there's been plenty of days where I psych myself into like, hey, you know what? Even if this is a bad day, what, what can I find? What, what's one thing I can find that's gonna make it a better day? Being in, in, in the NFL, I got my teammates. I got my teammates. I'm going to work. I get to play. I get to play for free. Well, not for free, but I get paid now. But I get to do this as my job. I get to do this as my job. And who am I to complain when I get to go to work and see my teammates? You know? I got the choice when I step in that building. How will I be through this day? How, what is, what is, what is going to be my attitude? Attitude is so important. Not just when you're young. It's going to carry on through your life, through your relationships. Attitude, you have the choice. Even in relationships, when you're with your significant other. Yeah, if you're married, you have the choice. You gotta lock in. You gotta choose to make that the best day ever. You gotta choose to make that choice and say, hey, my 30% might not be my 100, but it's my 100 for that day. You know, so hopefully that helped, coach. What's going on, boss, man? So like, obviously you're in the NFL. Um, <laughs> is, uh, is it obvious? I look like I'm in the NFL? No, 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 no. You can say I'm a hooper. No, no, both. both. <laughs> so, so uh, who's like the hardest player you've had to like tackle or guard? Yeah. I, I just find it <laughs> He said, who's the hardest player I had to tackle or guard? Honestly, 
going to Ohio State. I know I'm in the NFL, but going to Ohio State, that was probably my hardest competition. Um, but being in the NFL, I mean, everybody's great. <laughs> everybody's great. So Joe Barrow was at Ohio State with me. He ended up transferring too to go to LSU, Heisman candidate, number one overall pick. So it would be disrespectful if I said Joe wasn't the hardest player to go, go against. <laughs> so Joe, if you're watching this, if you see a clip, you are the hardest player to go, to go against. <laughs> honestly, honestly. I play defense, he plays offense. As a linebacker, we're the quarterbacks of the defense, so we got to make sure everybody in position. And I'll tell you right now, Joe, he's that second. He's, he's, he's building some stuff up. He's, he's just hey, he's a professional, man, and he does a well job, and uh, all respect to him. So, yeah, Joe Barrow for sure, man. Go ahead, bro. I feel like uh, focusing on mental health improves your performance. He said, dude, I feel like focusing on mental health improves my performance. Like I said, I feel like the game is 80% mental. I feel like if I didn't understand the playbook because I was in this mental fog, I didn't, you know, I just held every, bottled everything in, I wouldn't be able to perform the way I do, you know? So it definitely affects your, affects your uh, play performance. It affects your everyday life. How can I continue to go on if I'm not mentally straight up top? You gotta think about anything you do, whether it's going to the grocery store, working out. How are you gonna maximize that day, that moment, that rep, if all you can think about is, man, I'm not feeling so good. But like I said, if you're not feeling so good and that's your 10, your 10 percent for that day, that 20 percent, you just gotta fight through it. Cause you know why? I guarantee you, your friend next to you, he going through the same thing. He probably broke up with his girl the day before. He probably broke up with his girl the day before. I broke up with my girl. You doing the squat rack? I broke up with my girl. I broke up with my girl. <laughs> Boom. <laughs> but you right there to help him out. You like, man, I got you. I got you. I broke up with my girl too. <laughs> you know? You know? You gotta. That's really how you gotta do it. For me to get through days, honestly, it hasn't been a day where I haven't laughed. A laughter is like therapy to me. Laughter is therapy to me. Like, I have to laugh every day. If I'm not laughing, something wrong. You better ask me a question or something, because laughing, I laugh at the worst times too. So don't, forgive me. <laughs> but I hope that helps you, bro, like, honestly. Yep, no problem. What's going on, bro? Two questions. Uh, what made you choose Ohio State over any other school? And then what made you come back to Maryland? Yeah, so he said, what made me choose Ohio State over any other school? Ohio State, at the time was coming off a national championship. This was when they first uh, won their first college football playoff. I chose good counsel because they had won four championships in a row. I'm like, okay, I want to compete against the best. I want to compete against the best. And I'm not going to lie, I was close to going to Landon. And Mama Vassos can attest to that. <laughs> I was close. I was close to going to Landon. I was going to be rivals. And I was going to whip you off for four years. <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, they're like, they're like, nah, no, it wasn't gonna happen. But I knew at the time when I chose Ohio State, I said, you know what, in order for me to get to the NFL, I wanna compete against the best. I wanted competition. I wanted that. It was only gonna make me better. How can I get better if I'm not playing the same competition? That's the same reason I chose Good Counsel. I didn't start right away at Good Counsel. Just like any other freshman that's naive. Oh, I'm gonna come in there, I'm gonna start, I'm gonna do this. Freshman team, freshman football, line up. <laughs> so yeah, um, that was the first question. And then he said, what made me come back home to Maryland? And it was everything that led up to that point. I had gave blood, sweat. Not a big cry, but I do have emotions, I'm human. So, you know, it was, it was a lot that went into the program. I gave three years to a university where I felt like I couldn't give any, any more. I wasn't satisfied. It was more so sometimes, you know, that healthy relationship, that, that dysfunctional relationship, sometimes you got to separate in order to grow. And my position coach at the time, Luke Fickle, who was at Cincinnati, um, he left. He left after my freshman year. And then Coach Meyer ended up leaving after my junior year. So I'm like, okay, you guys leaving me, I gotta make a decision. I gotta take this into my hands. Just like I did at 10, 11, 12. I had to make a decision. I had to make a decision. And I was comfortable making that decision because I was like, okay, I'm taking my life into my hands. I had to control my future. I was not gonna let a coach tell me that 
I had to stay at this university when I wasn't even playing. All I played was special teams, but I made that sacrifice. I, I carved out a role. I had a role at Ohio State, but I wanted an even bigger role to get to the NFL, you know? So coming back home, I had every offer to come back home. I could have went to USC, Miami, Ole Miss, but I was like, you know what? This is where I start playing football. This is home. And I wanted my mother, she didn't have to drive to make it to Ohio State. I wanted her to experience that last year with me, you know? That's just my thought process of coming back home. I was like, you know what? I'm going to make it easy on my family and friends. If this is, which I never doubted that it was going to be, but with time, you just never know. I didn't know if that was going to be my last year of football or not. So I wanted to come back to where it all started. And it started here in Maryland. I played for Maplewood, if y'all. Any maple heads in here? <laughs> Little league. Um, as a high schooler, you mentioned you lived with seven different families. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure that took like a significant toll on your mental and emotional health. But you probably didn't recognize it until later in life. But if you could go back and give yourself a piece of advice or you know, some words of encouragement, what would you tell your high school self going through? My younger self, what would I tell my younger self uh, looking back now? Um, I would tell my younger self to live in the moment, to enjoy the process. Um, I feel like that's what I've always done. I've always enjoyed uh, those seven families. They're, they're, they're family. They're my family. Like the, Mama Vassos, Mama Strick, Mama Connors, everybody, like everybody, like, that's mom. I didn't have a dad, so I don't call the, the, the guy's dad, but they know I love them. They know I love them. I didn't have a dad, I'm gonna be honest. They was my coaches, they was my mentors. It was the old heads, the OGs, they, they call them, original. So uh, I would tell myself, just live in the moment, enjoy that time, and don't think about the future, because I I'd never thought, obviously I wanted to make it to the NFL. Obviously we want to you know, be very successful, but I never defined my success off of just this game of football. I was battling the game of life. I was, like I said, I was trying to survive. So those seven families, they helped me survive. Like, I wouldn't be here if they didn't take in, you know, me. Michael Orr, <laughs> younger, a younger Michael Orr. Like I said, my mother was always in the picture. She did her very best, but to take the stress off of her, I knew I had to make a decision like, all right, Ma, I gotta stay over here. Like, you're not gonna have to worry about nothing. I got us. I always thought I was the man of the house. I'm the middle, middle child. I just felt like I was the man of the house. I felt like I was the chosen one for my siblings. I, I don't know if everybody got siblings in here, but I just, I wanted, I wanted to make sure I was taking care of mom. <laughs> Hopefully that answer. <laughs> yes. Where's, where's your toughest away game environment in college? Where's my toughest away game environment? College and uh, professional. Man, Penn State was probably the most, I, I, I'm being filmed, right? I can say this now, I can say, I can probably say this now. No, the, fan, the fans, man, fans are, fans are wild. Fans are wild. I can just re remember being in, at Penn State and uh, being in that tunnel. And if you're familiar with Penn State, it's 100,000. And I feel like it's just college students. I don't know where the parents, where the old, <laughs> like honestly, I was, like, I was like, what's going on? It was like a lot of people and it was a whiteout. It was all white. I'm like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Mind you, I'm at Ohio State. We got about 80,000 in the stands, but we're kind of like quiet. We're not like, you know, energetic like, the, like Penn State. So coming into that environment, I can just remember being in that tunnel standing next to Coach Meyer. This is my freshman year. And I'm just looking in the stands. I'm trying to get myself hyped up. You know, I'm trying to do my little dance or whatever. And I can just see this fan. Hey, Myers. Hey, Myers. I'm not going to tell you what he said. He said some wild stuff uh, about, 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 about his family. And I was like, I was like, okay, we're in hostile territory. You don't, you, don't talk about, you don't talk about a man's family before he goes plays in, in a game. And, uh, I want to say, uh, I want to say we won that. I, yeah, we won that. I hope, I hope we won. <laughs> but um, uh, toughest crowd for NFL for the pros was Kansas City, and uh, that's why, man, I thought we were going to do it this year again. We've been to KC, you know, twice now in these last two years. We won there. 
We was gonna go right, we was gonna celebrate on that field and go back to our second Super Bowl. You couldn't tell me any different that night. But for some reason, KC, they just, the way they got their, their stadium constructed, like, it's like the noise just travels down. And this is like, you can't even hear, like, if I was standing next to Nick, you can't hear, like, what would you say? Like, getting a play call or something? It's difficult. And the fans are nonstop. My mom was in the stands. She doesn't like heights, so I'm sure she probably wasn't watching. <laughs> but, um, listen, like, yeah, that was hostile territory. KC and the, the fact that we lost to them, uh, I don't even want to talk about it. <laughs> but, yeah. So ever since I've known you, you've always been the happiest, laughiest guy. How did your teammates and friends react when you said you were you know, having a struggle? Um, that's a good question. My, my, t my friends and teammates, I feel like I hang around individuals like myself, like-minded, like myself. So like when I'm laughing, they're laughing. When they're serious, I'll get serious too. Like we talk about it, if you're around me, most likely, we're talking about something, you know, we're talking about life in general, you know? So we do check-ins, we do those check-ins. And it probably wasn't until I got more older where I realized, okay, me asking my friend like, hey, you doing all right? Hey, how your moms? Just checking up on people that I noticed that, wow, like we need to do this more often, you know? Because like how you said, I'm always joking, I'm always laughing, I'm always smiling. Like that's just naturally who I am, so I can't fake. I can't fake that. I really enjoy life because I understand how precious time is, and I understand like I can't get this back. And I want people to feel, you know, feel comfortable, feel love, feel like, like I said, I want to die empty. So if I'm giving all of me to you, like I want it in return. If you're in my circle, show me, show me, show me the same love, you know. So. I show love and I get it right back in return. And I, I go back right to the families that helped me get here. They showed me love like I was their son, you know? Like I was their nephew, like I was their, you know, anything. You know, they showed me that love. And I feel like it would be wrong if I didn't show that love to my friends because uh, reciprocation is so important, you know? If you're not in an unhealthy environment, unhealthy, if you're not in a healthy uh, relationship, I would say remove yourself from that situation, that situation because it's not benefiting you or your partner, your friend, your significant other. So yeah, just knowing that the reciprocation was there and we understood each other as friends and we could talk about our problems and joke about our problems, it could be the worst of worst. Um, but we talk about it, you know? So just the, that reciprocation like, oh, you going through this? I'm going through this too, it's crazy. And we talk about it and we laugh and we joke and whatever. And we try to figure out solutions. DeAndre, I got one yeah. question for you. Um, and I think I think we can kind of mm -hmm. wrap up after that. Um, but you said you had a village in your life when you were growing up and getting things going and kind of moving along. Who would you say, as a part of that village, was like the most influential person for you that like really pushed you along to like accomplish the goals that you've accomplished today? Oh, absolutely. Uh, he said, "Who was the most important?" Mm -hmm. I, it would have to start from the the woman that birthed me. The woman that birthed me, the woman that gave me that drive, the woman that gave me that motivation, the woman that still gives me that motivation, the woman that just pours into me and without asking for anything in return, uh, she's right in front of me. Uh, literally, literally, like, I, I don't know where I would be without you. I appreciate you, I value you, I respect you. I don't know if I ever told you face to face, but um, I'd rather do it in a crowded room anyway, because that just gives, you know, it puts, it puts the light, it puts the light on you. So uh, without my mother, I mean, I honestly couldn't do, be here and do the things I'm doing today. And uh, I have a long way to go. I'm just getting started, I'm only 25. Uh, so, nah, that's my mother though, for sure. Well, I just want to say thank you guys for all coming out tonight. Uh, we obviously really enjoyed all your questions and your amazing attention. So um, hopefully this isn't the last time that we get to see any of you guys. And we get to do this a lot more, a lot more often with a lot more people and yes. help, help a lot of people as well. So yes. like I said, thank you guys for coming. Thank you, know, you guys. Thank 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 you guys.